Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, we're trying something a little different. We've turned the podcast over to guest host Dan Gorenstein, a longtime health reporter based in Philadelphia and the host of the podcast Trade Offs. Dan talks with Dr. Albert Wu, the co director of a program at Johns Hopkins that provides emotional support to health system staff. This program is known as RISE, which stands for Resilience in Stressful Events. Their topic is the ongoing stress experienced by doctors, nurses, and others in the hospital as a result of the pandemic and what can be done to help. If you like this episode, check out the Tradeoffs two-part series on doctors coping with COVID at www.tradeoffs.org. On that note, I pass the mic to Dan. Thanks, Josh. It's great to be here today. Uh, so earlier this fall on our podcast, Tradeoffs, we produced a couple of episodes about the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of doctors and nurses. The episodes were called Doctors Coping with COVID. You can find them in our feed. And in speaking with the team here at Public Health on Call, they asked us to dig into the topic a bit with our guest today. Albert Wu. Albert's a professor of health policy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The other part of his job is one of the reasons we wanted to speak with him. I also help to organize staff support for Johns Hopkins Medicine. What does that mean, staff support? Staff support means providing, in particular, emotional support to all of the staff um, at the hospital and in the health system. Gotcha. So, Albert, during the first six months of the pandemic, we've heard a lot about the mental health struggles of doctors and nurses and other staff. In our reporting, we discussed a CDC report that found essential workers are about 50% likelier than other professionals to experience symptoms of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. To understand firsthand what doctors are going through, we spoke to a veteran emergency room doc, Mara Windsor. She's in Arizona. And Mara told us for the first time in her 15-year career, she's burnt out. Every shift I don't want to go to. And every time that I'm there, I don't want to be there. Albert, we're seeing new spikes of coronavirus But at the same time, we know a lot more about how to treat people and how to protect ourselves from the virus than we did in the spring. Do you think our healthcare system is better positioned to deal with coronavirus spikes now? So great question. Uh, I think we're better positioned. There is more certainty about what we're dealing with. We have a better idea of what we're doing and how to do it safely. There's more protections in place. The supply chains are better secured. There's more policy and even more enforcement of the things that we should do. And ultimately, what do you think is going to be different this time around? Uh, I think even if there is another big surge, we're unlikely to shut down completely, partly for practical reasons, partly because we realize that we probably cannot afford to do that. And I think that people who have been through this before are starting out with less reserve. They're tired. Many people feel like they're kind of done. And now they're being called back for another hitch, back to the front lines, and it's difficult. So you say that the tank for many of our frontline providers is low. Can you explain... Why are the reserves of our doctors and nurses so low right now? So um, I think that asking people to be heroic over and over again to run back into the fire multiple times gets harder each time. Studies of 
past disasters, which include hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes and some epidemics, um, suggest that there is almost always a predictable pattern of people's emotional response. There are phases, and the phases include anticipation and then the impact when the disaster hits, and then a heroic phase when people rally together, and then a long phase of disillusionment as resources diminish and people run out of adrenaline and then are left exhausted and demoralized. And and so when you think about what's going to be difficult for this phase over the fall and the winter, and really perhaps until a vaccine or vaccines are developed, you think it's going to be finding that reserve that's going to be difficult for our nurses and our doctors? I think so. And I think a challenge is going to be for leaders is going to be to provide enough support on all levels, both material and psychological, to help people keep at it. It's not really business as usual. People are not the people that we were six months ago. Going back to some of the reporting that we did in August and September, we spoke to a Philadelphia area psychiatrist, Mona Masood, who saw physicians struggling, and she sent out a message on a Facebook group. Calling all psychiatrists, who's with me in putting together a hotline for uh, physician colleagues navigating the COVID-19 crisis. An overwhelming amount of responses. It went from about uh, 50 people to 100 people. Ultimately, Mona launched the physician support line. And at one point, the hotline included 700 volunteer psychiatrists fielding 8,000 minutes of calls from physicians each month. In a way, Albert, Mona's experience, the popularity of this hotline, in some ways, could be seen as an indictment that many don't feel comfortable going to their superiors looking for support when they are stretched thin. What have you learned over the past six months about providers' willingness to speak up and seek the mental health care that they need, especially now as you talk about people's reserves being so low? I think that physicians and other clinicians have an ingrained resistance to asking for help. It's not what they were trained to do. It's not what people around them do. It's not part of the culture. But what we've learned over the last six months is that when everyone is anxious and fearful, when that is perhaps the norm rather than a sign of weakness or deviance, then people uh, are more willing to, to ask for help. Albert, in his capacity as staff support organizer, says that before COVID, his center was getting about 10 phone calls a month, but that shot up over the first 100 days of the pandemic. We went up to having 30 or 40 calls a month and supporting up up to a couple of hundred individual people. Albert, as we approach winter, do you think people are going to keep reaching out? Since September and October, uh, we've had whole units who've made requests for more support for all of their staff. And that's something which never happened before. And we are getting people who are calling for problems, routine problems that have nothing to do with COVID. Maybe someone makes a medication error. But we're getting more of those calls now. And I don't think it's because all of a sudden there's all sorts of mistakes happening in the hospital. I think it's because their threshold for calling has decreased. One of the people that we spoke to for our reporting on mental health and frontline providers was University of Michigan's Dr. Catherine Gold. And Gold found that stigma is a leading reason that docs don't ask for help or even acknowledge their mental health distress. They're really, at the end of the day, fearful of blowback uh, from employers and medical licensing boards. People talked about being pulled out of surgery randomly for drug testing because they'd reported depression. People have had episodes where they're restricted from practice, where they're forced into drug treatment 
again, even without any kind of history of drug issues. People have talked about coercion in which they're told, well, unless you submit to our psychiatric analysis and go through this long treatment program, which maybe is thirty dollars or $40,000, you can't get your license back. Have you heard similar sorts of anecdotes over your 30-year career? Certainly, um, if you wind up with a diagnosis of depression, licensing boards may may ask you about it and they may put conditions on you to do something about it for uh, before you can be relicensed. But I think that is really a small minority of cases. And in my observation, that is not the main impediment to people asking for help. So what do you think is the main impediment for physicians to ask for help? I really feel like that it really is more of an internalized wound in general that prevents people from asking for help. They have a self-perception that they are not the kind of person who needs help. Other people may, but that's not me. Their self-image depends on being able to stay strong, to not to express emotion, to just soldier on. And the act of asking for help runs counter to that self-image, when in fact, they probably perform less well as a result of repressing you know, that human part of them. One lasting story stands out. A young physician unsuccessfully attempted suicide and then asked colleagues for help. But the physician didn't want anyone to know. Please don't tell anyone about this. I don't want them to think I was weak. And that is just a, uh, a, a real indictment of the prevailing culture, that even if you've attempted to harm yourself, you're still so ashamed of it that you might not have even called someone if other people then got a negative perception of you in one way or another. Albert says hospital leadership must remember the fear many doctors and nurses have when it comes to talking about any mental health problems. Fear of professional reprisal, fear of diminished collegial respect, the stigma that pervades medicine. I think that top leaders in institutions need to make it very clear that uh, to their staff that I've got your back. For me, the CEO or the president of the hospital, uh, your well-being and your resilience is important to me. And they, they need to m- make sure that there are support systems and then they need to essentially try to persuade people that it's okay to use them. A- Albert, is there any reason to think that one of the silver linings from the pandemic is that health system leaders and physician leaders and nurse leaders are going to look at the mental health needs of their staff in a different way? I think so. I think that I think that there are some silver linings. It's almost like we've discovered that the well-being of staff is not just an HR concern. You know, I think that the well-being and the resilience of healthcare workers has been mission critical in the COVID response. And this has been made crystal clear to, to everybody. And I think that we now have newfound respect for all of these less visible colleagues who are nonetheless crucial to our functioning too. People who did the laundry, cleaners, people who transported patients, people who were serving food, these were really frontline workers who were at risk themselves. And some of those people, in fact, called our support services for the very first time. Albert, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. It's really been a privilege. Dr. Albert Wu is professor of health policy at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please check out the two episodes that inspired it, Doctors Coping with COVID. Subscribe to Tradeoffs wherever you get your podcasts. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen-McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin. 
with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.